Hi guys, Lionheart here, and before we jump on into the interview and to kind of general discussion that I had with Simon Mann, the battles designer for Total War Warhammer, just want to give you guys a heads up that CA were actually having some office work, some builders in, um, when I was interviewing Simon. I got a really nice long time to sit down and chat to Simon, um, so unfortunately there is a little bit of kind of drilling noise uh, across the video, but you should still be able to hear everything it says. So it shouldn't be too much of an issue I also just want to say that I, I wasn't that prepared for this interview So the questions that I had kind of just fell out from my head from uh, Stuff I'd noticed from playing the ambush at thundering falls battle quest battle uh, earlier that day and some kind of longer standing issues that I'd had in mind um, In my head, but if you have any questions that you want put towards CA feel free to throw them down in the comment section because uh, I'll be attending EGX and I'll do my best to get another interview with them there. So if you have any questions, any follow-ups, uh, any you know burning questions you really have and you really want CA to address, uh, I will interview them at, at EGX and put your questions to them. So uh, without further ado, um, here we go. Enjoy the, the interview and general discussion. Okay, so I'm here with Simon Mann, the uh, battles developer for Total War Warhammer. Um, specifically looking at quest battles. Yeah. I do a lot. There and I've been actually had the opportunity to take a look at a, a new quest battle today, the ambush at the Thundering Falls, featuring mm -hmm. the, the dwarves versus the, the orcs and the goblins. The greenskins, the greenskins as a race yeah. as a whole, yeah. So that was a lot of fun. Um, definitely a, a, a new scenario again, quest battles are a new type of battle we haven't experienced before in Total War. In this particular battle we had uh, reinforcements of the greenskin forces coming in, not just from the flank, uh, from the sides, but also from, from the rear flank as well. Uh, caught me out with some uh, some giants there, and the slayers had to be thrown in quite quickly. Uh, <laughs> although as dwarves, they're not the fastest. Um, <laughs> no, they are around, the so great, yeah. It was sort of are they going to get there in time? <laughs> but uh, a lot of um, diversity within those units. Dwarves focusing on that called defensive, um, you know, uh, strength positioning and all those wonderful pieces of artillery such as the organ gun had gyrocopters appear at one moment which can also drop a couple of bombs on on units mm -hmm. um that battle as a whole um what sort of features is that sort of showing off from from warhammer you know so far that you really quite exciting and different that we haven't sort of seen before so i think kind of the last thing people have really seen before this will have been the blackfire pass battle of course you know kind of we're very much kind of espousing the kind of like positives of it and saying, you know, this is our battle engine, this is it, and this is kind of for me, this is us saying, it is our battle engine, this is yeah. really our game, this is what we're working, and there's kind of very little scripting to these quest battles, right? We really want to let, certainly from an AI perspective, we really want to let the AI show you what it's good at and show you its kind of, yeah, kind of like um, the things that it does well. So, you know, very much one of the first things I think you can kind of agree on from playing it is that the AI is actually. Kind of pretty competitive using the new unit types that we've brought in, right? Yeah. You know, like we're showing you things. So, as the dwarfs, for example, like they're very much not a magic race. Like they think magic is silly. It's all below them, really. They're quite snobbish. Um, so, you know, they don't have magic. But you'll have seen that the greenskins have a caster in their army, like a goblin shaman on a wolf. And like he's able to cast spells at you, and that's all done under the AI. The AI is making decisions to choose where to cast the spells and things like that, and I'm sure you felt the effect firsthand of what happens yeah. when <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, uh, you cast. I mean, it certainly um, I felt that the AI was able to discern which were my weaker units. Um, it went for my artillery to try and you know prevent uh, my organ guns from firing and Curse of the Bat Moon mm. wrecked on through that. I was trying to pull some um, some long beards through it out there. Uh, just got caught at the edge, but um, it, it was... It, Quite, um, there were two modes in, in there to try, easy, easy and hard, and it was quite challenging. I, I had to keep my, my wits about me, and I, I missed a, a giant um, rear charge and had to scramble those slayers. How did you miss a giant? <laughs> Didn't look at my mini map. <laughs> Viewers on my channel will know I often miss the mini map. <sighs> Rookie mistake, Total 101, check your <laughs> mini map. Um, great to see the reinforcement um, system coming in. Mm. Um, with that, it felt like a very big scale battle. Um, in terms of um, performance, how, how is Warhammer shaping up to cope with all those units on the battlefield, not on, on screen? Because, mm, yeah, as you say, like, we've got a lot more than we have in kind of previous games, right? You're not just talking multiple human skeletons yeah. in the battle, you're talking spiders. <laughs> you yeah. can't really, so you know, when you're doing animation... Polygons to deal with. Yeah, well, not even more polygons, but from an animation perspective, you know, uh, 
every model has what we call an animation skeleton underneath, which kind of defines how they move and their bones and stuff like that. But for example, you've got a bipedal skeleton, which would be for a human, but then you can't really map that onto an orc or a goblin, for example. Like you have to make kind of different skeletons for each of these things. And then, for example, an arachnorock, right? Like yeah. eight legs, you've got to animate all like, those legs, have it moving, feeling right. And like the animator's done a really good job with it as well. But, you know, kind of from the point of view of getting all this in, we've taken quite a lot of time kind of planning how we can do this and the ways in which we kind of get this data into a battlefield to keep the performance comparable to our previous games, right? Because we want it to be something people can play and have good performance from that. So we've taken lots of kind of steps under the hood to try and make sure that the kind of battles still play effectively and efficiently, and like especially the environments as well. We've done lots of work on that. Um, continuing to improve, like Attila made some big steps, but continuing to improve our VFX system. Right. And also like lots of kind of little extra fixes to rendering techniques, things like that, just to kind of lower all the costs and make it also look yeah. better, right? Like, so it should, it should give um, improved performance or at least across the scale of kind of high-end systems and lower-end systems be a, be a game that can, can run across most of We those. always hope so. So we're gonna, you know, we're still in pre-alpha very much yeah. and we're still kind of developing features, changing things, tweaking stuff. So kind of, you know, the system requirements and specifications are always gonna kind of shift up and down as the project goes. But yeah, we're aiming for as broad a market as we can, but high end's gonna look really good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you able to specifically mention what sort of um, technologies um, you're, you're looking at for, for those engine requirements? I know DirectX 12 has recently um, arrived, and um, obviously a lot of uh, gamers are looking forward to games in 2016 that may take advantage of that technology, especially uh, lots of gamers that understand the p potential impact of DirectX 12, looking at helping out CPU processing and, and graphics card doing more of that. It's obviously something where Total has always been very processor intensive. Hmm. Is, is that something which Warhammer's looking to, to work on? So I think as Total War is a team as well, like because we're PC centric, always have been, and fingers crossed always will be very much PC centric from that perspective. Like we're always looking at the kind of new technologies and stuff, but I say it's all stuff that we're just playing around with at the moment. Yep. So we're going to sort of probably come to some decisions kind of as we get slightly closer to release date from that. But we're always looking into so like the latest technology, you know, yeah, because we have to wear PC, right? Like yeah, PCs all about to. like the cool shiny stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way forward. Okay. Um, what would you say is your favourite dwarven unit? My favourite dwarven unit. Yes. Hmm, okay. I mean, I actually have to admit, I really like the gyrocopters. Yep. Um, they're just so different from like everything you've ever seen and actually as a as a player like playing the game and using the dwarf factions they're probably one of their best units in my opinion because like one of the things we were trying to show you were asking about kind of what the kind of big differences you'd see from previous games like as well as the kind of look of the arms the actual the way they play the way they balance is very different we've gone very much down the route of like armies have strengths and weaknesses as it were and they're quite clear cut and very much based off their their law almost yeah. as right so for example dwarves like you know they're quite slow Right, and they rely very heavily on the damage their artillery deals. Like their artillery and their range units, they're damage dealers, while their infantry are their kind of damage soakers, they're the kind of tank units for them as they were. So the dwarves are very good at holding a position. Like on the defense, dwarves are pretty much kind of, you can't yeah. beat them, they're really difficult to break. Yeah, yeah, exactly, you know, unless you get attacked in the rear by some trolls, which <laughs> yeah. can sometimes take you by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like then you're seeing the greenskins as well. Like the greenskins capitalise on that. Like they are all about fast moving spider riders, kind of wolf riders, boar boys, all that sort of stuff. They're all about hitting you where it hurts as quickly as possible. But if you can kind of weather their initial assaults, they then fall down. But then the gyrocopters as the dwarves give you that extra bit of mobility and that ability to actually target something in the back. Like in that battle, I always tend to send them either against their Doom Diver catapults or go straight in for the enemy shaman, because of course killing the general has a morale shock on the rest of the army, and Greenskin's morale is already a little bit shaky to begin with, yeah. right? So like, I tend to send it against that, but I also really love like the little things we've taken from the game. Like first of all, they look like the models from the tabletop game, right? Like we've pretty much faithfully recreated every single model. But then also you've got the abilities coming through. So you know, from the tabletop war game, you can drop bombs with gyrocopters. That's a thing you can do, and we've kind of emulated that and kind of done it Total War style, if you know what I mean. So yeah. like we've taken the kind of the spirit and what's really cool about it and actually brought that in as a mechanic. So I'm sure you tried it out a little bit, you know, you fly over, you press the ability, the bombs kind of drop down, dealing yeah. damage to 
your units and their units, depending on. Just <laughs> kind of like you want to finish off a huge Ragnarok. It was very low on health, dropped a couple of bombs. Brilliant animation, watching the, the, the little goblins fly off it and <laughs> smash on into the ground. Um, animation, that, um, as we mentioned earlier, with all different skeletons, they look very impressive. There's, there's a lot of animation um, going on across the battlefield. It's great to zoom in and get stuck into those, those battles, as it's always been with Total War. It's always been great to, to command armies from up on high, but it's great to zoom on in. Um, I think that's especially so now, but even more than ever, just because of the variety of units and like each one's hand animated, as we were saying with the kind of skeleton and stuff like. Each unit is hand animated, so they all have that little bit of character to them. Love, They're all a little. I bit love different. the little uh, sort of um, the flowing beard, sort of as they're, as they're getting stuck in with the doors. It's flying <laughs> it's around. It's getting in there, and the, the, there's armor on the. Um, I think one of the, the dwarven units with the flamethrowers. The iron drakes. The iron drakes. Oh, they've got this armor on their beard so that they don't set their beards on fire. Fantastic. <laughs> they thought it through. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, so this is a subterranean quest battle, mm. and wow, uh, we've not gone underground in, in Total War before, and this is fantastic. And, and the tunnel system, and it wasn't a, a tight little cramped tunnel. This was a, oh, a highway. No. Um, and you have different tunnels coming onto the, this main highway, uh, a bridge at one point, and those are all used as reinforcing points for the Greenskins in this quest battle to reinforce and to try and um, you know shift the Dwarven position. And you've got to see if you can if you can hold that and resist all these strikes. But I mean, creating the the subterranean environment. Can you tell us a bit more about that and how that's sort of. I guess it brought something totally different to, to Total War. Well, so first of all, it was something we always wanted to bring to the table. I mean, the dwarfs very much are an underground race, and the greenskins as well, to a certain extent, right? Like, we wanted to bring this idea of something called the Underway. This is kind of in the law here, so it's another way of bringing kind of Warhammer law to life, as it were. But the Underway is basically, as you were saying, it's kind of like a series of motorways kind of underneath the earth that the dwarfs built centuries and centuries ago to travel between their Karaks or cities, basically. Karak is like dwarf and fort, basically. They're yes. really heavily defended areas. And it's the way they kind of move around them. But, you know, over the years, the goblins have come in and infested the tunnels, and, you know, the number of dwarfs is on the wane. Like, they are a race yeah. kind of almost perishing, basically. They're slowly, slowly dying out. With dwarfs, they're slow. Yeah. But, like, it's all slowly dying out. So, you know, we wanted to bring this feature into the game. So we kind of really early on said, right, we're going to do subterranean. We want that underground feeling because it's a battlefield type we've never done, and we wouldn't generally be able to do. Like in historical battles, there are very few situations where you'd actually have a full underground battle like that. And of course, because it's fantasy, let's make it epic. Let's make it really, really big, right? So we built this environment, and I think you can see we've done lots with kind of the way the lighting works and yeah. the kind of environment that's set in there. So kind of the lighting environment, the way the scene is kind of rendered to you, like. The terrain and stuff, and we did very much go for this idea that it's kind of yeah, fallen glory of the dwarfs. Yeah, there was a I saw a couple of other bridges sort of off in, in the in the background scene that sort of fallen apart, and there was moss and you know all mm. that going on. It, it was actually it was quite um, startling just to start with the battle. Actually, look up and see this sort of cavernous ceiling uh, with all you know the the various. It's very there. interesting. I mean, you know, we've done some. We're still playing with it, of course, pre-alpha, but. You know, we've even done things like we've lowered the camera slightly, so kind of max camera height is slightly lower in, you're much closer, you're gonna... Because although the land feels large, you kind of still feel like you're enclosed. There's that kind of almost claustrophobia coming in from the low ceiling that's kind of above you. Yeah, especially in that ambush setting, um, you do feel trapped and, you know, this is... You know, it doesn't necessarily feel like a, a complete last stand, but you've certainly got to, you know, hold your ground here, hold the lines. Again, we've got a couple of, of organ guns there, and uh, really enjoyed pressing insert and going into first person mode and firing and tearing apart uh, the the goblin ranks there. Uh, one uh, feature I was shown actually, which um, is, is a question I'm always asked on my let's plays and my videos of how do you, Lama, how do you show where your units are going? And that's holding down spacebar. But holding down spacebar on this actually brought up a, a toggle panel of um, like the map markers, the unit mm. movement points, so you can actually tweak which um, statistics and so like unit health bars can be turned on and off directly through that. So you create this kind of customizable experience because previously we've had, I mean you could probably toggle some of them on and off via the options mm. but not directly in the game. Yeah, yeah. Or you could press K and go in complete cinematic mode which, which again looks great and you've obviously got the, the zoom cinematic zoom feature by pressing N. Mm. But this allowed you so much customization um, on that panel, then uh, are we are we like to see more customization throughout? So you're the first person to actually mention yeah, that feature, feature in yes. interview so far, so that's quite cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of I think it's quite a cool little thing. Like certainly the way I play, 
Like, I like a lot of information. I always say, for example, like, I like my general Zora, right? Like, I don't want to hold down space to see my general Zora, because actually, when I'm positioning my general, it's probably one of the most vital bits of information, because, you know, when you're within the aura, you get a morale bonus, you know, and it's, it's generally good for your units, especially if yeah. they're shaken. So, you know, you can actually click the little padlock, and that locks it on permanently. So it's no longer just when you've got space held, it's there it. forever. You can even change it so you can see all units' health at all times. So it's almost like you can make it so that you've almost got space bar down all the time, if you know yeah. what I mean, with certain features that you've chosen to lock on, and then hide certain things that you never want. Maybe you don't want to see the firing up to you because you're a pro, and you know exactly what <laughs> yeah. the firing up. So you just like hide the firing arcs in space yeah. and in the main game, and then you know. So and I know exactly what my units' range is. I don't need to concern myself with that. So it's a lovely little bit of user customization. I think yeah, we're kind of yeah. trying to bring lots of little kind of tweaks and tweaks features in, the user like that to do it. Tailor the game to their own. You know, because we're still very much total war, and we've been doing it for 15 years this year. Yeah. It's quite exciting. Um, not myself personally, but you know, because um, I would have been quite young. But <laughs> you know, but like yeah, we've been doing total war for 15 years, and there's lots of things that we've always done very well. But I think the nice thing is, as a studio, we're kind of looking at the things we do and saying, can we do that better? Is there something we can do to make that more interesting? Again, like Warhammer, we've really been able to let our hair down with stuff like that. You know, like, we've added in loads of new features, flying units, once again, like magic, all those kind of new fantasy kind of things from the Warhammer universe that we've been able to bring into this. It's really let us kind of examine our mechanics and kind of look at what we're doing. And so sort of go, yeah, how do we do this? Can we make this better? Can we improve these little things? And that's actually been quite a nice, for me personally, like a nice little part in that we're kind of taking Total War as we know it, and kind of, yeah, just kind of yeah. doing some little tweaks, improvements, and just sort of generally making it better, I hope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, from a, from a user and kind of the, the comments and, and, and sort of what I've seen quite vocally through the community, that they always want more customization, they always want, um, not they, but myself included, we always, we always want. I. Um, I, I would like this, please. Um, I'll talk about my own unit later. Um, <laughs> but always want more ways to customise your experience um, and not just specific units but the overall feel as well and I feel particularly in battles that's going to be quite a, a good feature because it will allow you to completely you know customise what information you see in the battle but if you don't want it you can very quickly again pressing you know holding down spacebar get that menu back up on, on the right hand side and, and change uh, what's available to you. So uh, again, I was really surprised when I saw that. I was like, wow, I hadn't nothing even, you know, mentioned about this. I'm, glad, I'm glad you liked it. Like, that's I really cool. like that feature. Again, I'm always for extra customization. Mm. Um, so I know you can't say a lot about campaign map, but you've been talking about tunnels and underground. I heard that they might be they might be appearing on the campaign map in, in some way or another as well. Yeah, so like kind of from the campaign map years, so we've got four playable races. So as with any Total War game, you kind of pick your race at the start of the game and then kind of you enter into the campaign map from there and you're all on the same campaign map, you're all in the old world from Warhammer. Once again, we're kind of really trying to bring the lore of Warhammer into this, so even if you're not a fan of Warhammer, hopefully by the end of it you will be. Um, but that's the idea, we bring you in and then we start you off with a kind of prelude that introduces you to your character and stuff like that, and the quest map you saw there was actually from one of the preludes for Thorgrim. So when you start playing as the dwarf, that's the kind of thing you're going to see, it's the way of us kind of uh, walking you through quest battles, as it were, you know. It's still very much sandbox, but they're kind of holding your hand and introducing you to stuff slowly so you can kind of take it all in. Because even for an experienced Total War player, I think there's a lot to get used to. Like, yeah. I don't think we've had anything that different in a Total War game for a long time, where it's like literally kind of, the table's been <laughs> yeah, just, turned just, over and the rules have been changed by so much. And like, you know, lots of different unit types, lots of things to get used to, um, especially on the campaign map. Like, we've really got this strong idea of your characters, right? So, you know, Thorgrim, you know, we keep mentioning these big, kind of bombastic characters from the Warhammer universe, like Thorgrim, Karl Franz, people like that, like, they all protagonists, yeah. as it were, throughout the game, you know, like, you, they can't die, they don't age, we don't have any concept of time moving forwards, so they're, they're there, you're playing through their story in the Warhammer world, but in very much a sandbox That's as well. what engages you, whereas traditionally something like a family tree, or, you know, Aging and dying would attach you to specific characters at certain points. Yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the, the skill trees develop. I've, I've read Big some articles trees, yeah. which have mentioned, yeah, huge skill trees. We've kind of got 30 character levels, and the skill wow. trees are branching and have multiple elements. Like you know, you can focus. Say, for example, you've got like a uh, a dwarf and thane. So you've got a thane in that battle. That you know, he's got his own skill tree. You can level him up to make him really good on the campaign side because he's a hero. You know, he's active on your campaign map and able to kind of perform actions for you and things like that, but then also for the first time, which I think is a really cool little feature, is you can bring him into 
battle with him. You can attack, when you deploy him in an army, he actually enters battle yeah. with the rest of your troops, as you saw there. And he's got a battle kind of tree to him, you know, a yeah. tree that makes him better at fighting things. He's a tough little guy as well. I saw him, is, I saw him well. throwing him in there, and he was, you know, he was smacking out the. Uh, the damage there, I think he nearly got caught off guard by the Arachnorok at one point, but he was supported by the Slayers. If you're firing off his abilities, which of course you would have upgraded on the campaign map, yeah, like these are... Bonuses to charge, and, yeah, and exactly. you, know, you can affect the morale of enemy troops by using his hammer, and yeah, I really like the the implementation of that, because I wasn't sure how long, it's like, how can a single unit really, um, you know, how can that change in getting agents from the campaign map, but I, I love that that RPG element, again, customization even further in Warhammer, and, um, well, they are literally bigger characters. I mean, we've actually yeah. made them larger on the battlefield so yeah. that they kind of distinct yeah. themselves from what's actually there to begin with. But of course, once again, your Thane is a, he's a risk, right? So let's say your Thane is kind of max level or something. Yeah. Like, it's taking you a long time to level him because he doesn't age. You've kind of, maybe you've grown close, you know, yeah, you, kind of, yeah. you feel like brothers in arms yeah. and you're fighting way through. But unlike our major story characters, any other characters or kind of lords that you hire no. can die. So by taking him into battle, you're, yeah. You're, you're risking, risking him, yeah, right? Because yeah, you know you put so much effort into it, and like you know, so you've been so many really cool hammer. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the best hammer. I got to see the hammer. Oh no, we're losing. Oh yeah, no, he's exactly. going. And then I'm, I'm really hoping people kind of feel that pain, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. absolute pain of like your favourite character dying. Because I say you've grown close. You've been on adventures together. You've yeah. fought in quests. Yeah. You know, you fought an epic quest battle together. You yeah. know, and you're no respawns, guys. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. But, um, and, but like, yeah, but then, you know, kind of that's a nice campaign feature, but then each race is going to feel totally different, right? They're going to feel like you're kind of playing a different game almost, like the, the number of mechanics that each does and like the way we focused things. So like, a lot of the things you'd expect from Total War are still available, right? So we've got things like diplomacy, politics, economi economics, war, recruitment, things like that. That all kind of exists as, as previously, but different races, we've dialed it in different fashions. Imagine like an amp, you've turned it kind of from 1 yeah. to 11, hopefully, like at this point. And that's so, for example, the Empire very much, because of the political situation, you know, Karl Franz has been made the Emperor, but it's pretty much just a kind of nominal title, like he's not super powerful, he's kind of a, he's kind of a hostage to the elector counts. Right. So he's part of a kind of, it's almost a democracy, but not quite. Not quite. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of kind of political wheeling and dealing and yeah. backstabbery and awfulness going on there, and he's got to he's got to play through that, like, kind of very much so. But then you see the Greenskins, they don't care about building empires and no. kind of protecting their economy and you know, building wells. Sitting and down with you and going, well, we would like to offer you a thousand gold for a trade agreement. I can't really, you know, you can't, you can't see that. So it's going to be... You can if you want to, right? Can you? You, can, you can have some diplom you have diplomatic options as the green scheme. Right. If you want to make peace with the empire, you can try. <laughs> try okay. I'm not going to suggest it will be easy yeah. and they'll probably still hate you. <laughs> So it'll eventually break down, but yeah, you do have diplomatic options, but I say with the Greenskins, they're all about war. Like, yeah. they are totally about fighting and killing and looting and pillaging and raiding. And to do that, we've kind of taken more mechanics from the Warhammer game, like the war. Yeah. So basically, you know, as you keep fighting and winning battles, you know... The momentum builds and... It builds. Like, Greenskins don't like being on the losing side. Like, if, yeah. if there are two Lords and one of them keeps winning and the other one keeps losing, nobody... Like, fight. that guy's on his own or dead. <laughs> Yeah. But if you're winning that, it's like, hey, that guy's a winner, we're going to get loads of gold and loot, so let's fight that dude. So, yeah, as you're fighting through in the battle, you can trigger the war, and suddenly you've got extra troops, you know, everyone's coming in to help, and you fight. But then, as the Greenskins, if you're not fighting, animosity kicks in, which is another kind of rule from the tabletop game that we brought into the campaign. But then, basically, animosity kicks in, because if they haven't got anyone else to fight, they just fight each other. Yeah. They've got to fight something. Start it's in their nature. Yeah. They've got to hit something like that and play it that way, and then, Kind of thirdly, like you've got the dwarves, and they've got some really cool little mechanics. Also, first of all, as you said, with the underway, they're actually able to enter the underway to travel around the campaign map. So, you know, any time you can kind of enter the underway and travel from point to point. So, okay. say you're kind of on one side, there's a mountain, and you want to get to the other side of the mountain, possibly to launch an attack against kind of another faction or something like that. Then. You can actually just do that, and the mountains like it's not an obstacle for you. Yeah. You can go quickly read a under the mountain. You yeah, basically. Easy. So it's a really good way. Also, think about like if you had to escape, if there's an enemy army, yeah. or a, more than one, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. many enemy armies trying to chase you down, you can just 
go onto the mountain and you're safe. Like, they can't get you at that. Really looking forward to see how that works, because the only mechanic I can ever kind of think that we've seen sort of like that is when we had railways in Fall of the Samurai mm. for Shogun 2, and obviously you provided there was a railway station at the various points and developed enough, you could jump on at one point and pop out the other, so mm. I'm excited It's a lot more kind of freeform in this instance. Yeah, see how those, how those tunnels... And They've also got really cool victory conditions though, like, um, so basically you saw Thorgrim in the intro, you had a large book. Yeah, he's on his throne, carried by... Um, so that's the Damas Kron, as right. it's called in Dwarf, and the, uh, the Great Book of Grudges. Now, there's, there's more than one of these in the world, but this is Thorgrim's one. It's basically a bucket list of, <laughs> like, wrongs that have been done against the dwarfs that must be avenged. Basically, you know, so like if somebody's insulted their beard, yeah, or something like that, you know, that, that goes in. He insulted my beard. He's going down. Right, right, I'm <laughs> taking him out. And like it's all that thing, and that's part of our campaign mechanic. Because when you're playing with the dwarfs, you have some grudges. Like as I was saying before, the greenskins have kind of moved in after a giant earthquake. The greenskins moved in and took a lot of the dwarf and kind of strongholds, the Karaks, a lot of them fell to the greenskins and like, you know, dwarfs are going to have grudges, which is, you know, yeah. <laughs> get them back, please, get them back. like do all sorts of things so, like that, and then you add to them during the game, so if anyone wrongs you while you're playing through the game, So that creates a new objective on this for you to, to write that, that wrong, it's that It's a new grudge. kind of mission that you've got oh, to fantastic. complete, and you can't win as the dwarfs until you've you closed the book. Wow, well. okay. Which can be really cool, and the yeah. dwarfs are very easily offended. Well, that's, that's really interesting, <laughs> I, actually, I actually thought, um, and proposed this when I was taking a look at the the Thorgrim Grudge Bearer trailer and did a little mm. bit of analysis and impressions on that the other the, the other week, um, and I said I, I hope there'll be a way of integrating those grudges as creating new objectives for you as the dwarves. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just great to hear that's in. I'm really happy to hear that. That's <laughs> that's what I thought it was potentially going to be. I think it's really interesting. We've grudges. not done anything that dynamic with like yeah. missions and objectives, so I actually think that's quite an interesting. Yeah, you're you're creating your objectives by you know. If, if that's happened, grudge. Yeah. It's kind of almost the opposite, isn't it? Because it's not you creating. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's a reaction, isn't it? Yeah, it's, that, that's the thing what I like about it. It's like kind of the world around you is affecting you. It moulds what you have to achieve. Yeah, it moulds the way you play. And that, actually, it's kind of a nice way to do that. Because generally, it's very difficult to make the world around you specifically change your actions. Generally, yeah. as a player, you're sort of like, well, I'm, I'm doing this. I've made a decision here, right? So you look at the world and then make a decision. Whereas this is kind of the other way, where the world looks at you and makes the decision for you as to what you've actually got to do, and, and then you can choose when to react to it and how you want to react to it. So that's actually a kind of really interesting Fantastic. thing to try out, yeah. Brilliant. Um, is there anything you can tease chaos-wise? Uh, fortunately not, you know, like, we've got quite a lot to go, we're still in pre alpha so, you know, kind of, yeah. we're constantly exploring what we're going to do <laughs> with various, I mean, there's 16 races. 16 races. In plus. plus. <laughs> in the Warhammer universe, and so far we're only doing four, we really want to concentrate on our cause, so you know, nothing to say quite yet, but you know, watch this space. You mentioned earlier the dwarves aren't you know, focusing on magic, is there any implementation of runes for the dwarves at all? So the they have yeah. rune smiths, yep. which is something they've got, but we're going to be talking about that at a later date, and that'll be quite exciting. Fantastic, I'm excited to hear <laughs> all that, had to ask about the runes. In terms of balancing, mm. um, how difficult has that been? I mean, um, you've not only got um, different um, different kind of types of unit, but also different sizes, mm. uh, and, and uh, all that reacting. Um, I don't know if you can talk on from that about how multiplayer might possibly um, be developing at the moment, but uh, that must be quite a challenge to, you know, how, how do you, within so potentially a multiplayer setting, um, you know, a giant versus a unit of infantry or something like that, or, or is that again something where you're looking at the tabletop and a point system or something like that about how you construct your armies? Mm. So we're taking a quite total war stance with this, but also at the same time we're kind of just embracing the differences between units, right? Because I think that's part of the coolness is that you've got a unit of infantry versus a giant unit at this point, but like the whole thing is a giant unit is one attack, basically, yeah. in a melee combat way. It's pretty darn powerful attack, but it's just like one attack, so you know, like units of infantry are able to surround that unit and all the units that are in contact are going to be striking against that giant, so you've got damage over time from an infantry unit, but then the giant is smashing, like the giant is meant to be strong against those kind yeah. of units, but also the giant can be mobbed and taken down, I'm, like, I'm sure one of the ways that the Arachnarok has been taken down in the demo is that people get a few units and surround it and they're all hitting it and they take down this kind of monstrous behemoth like all at once and these are high tier expensive units right like against one on one against a unit of infantry they will win like I can't see them losing yeah. they just kick so much ass but 
Like when you've got them surrounded with your infantry and you're firing, also got to remember, you're like your ranged units are extremely strong against these giant units. Because whereas previously, if you've got a man, one of your units in front of you while you're firing on an enemy unit, there's a line of sight, right? Like you can't see to shoot, especially with a rifle or something like that. But when you've got a unit that's up there, <laughs> you just aim up. It's really easy. Yeah. So like that's kind of the way we're kind of balancing it, embracing it from that perspective. Multiplayer, it's something you know, like we're still doing multiplayer as you have seen in kind of Attila and Rome and stuff like that. But like it's something we're kind of still working. We're concentrating mainly on the single player portions of the game, and then we'll be looking kind of more towards the kind of yeah custom battles, multiplayer sort of thing as we move forward with that. Okay. In terms of, of scale of of armies, are we looking at the the twenty stack, or are we looking at the, having forty sort of stacks in there and reinforcing and adding more units in? How big can battles, you know, ultimately get in in Warhammer? Because you talked about the reinforcing system. Mm. Um, you know, is that just a kind of quest battles where almost an unlimited pool could just filter, keep filtering in with these waves of reinforcements, mm. or uh, on the campaign is that a specific? stack close by is reinforcing directly into that ambush or that, that assault. So quest battles, we do do kind of lots of things with reinforcements. Once again, as I was saying, we're not really scripting AI, so we're taking our cues from other places, so we're kind of playing around with elements such as deployment, uh, army makeups, reinforcements, the timing of those reinforcements, possibly even the objectives that you do in battle, right? So we're going to play around with a lot of stuff. So definitely you'll see it to a greater extent within a quest battle because it's kind of for us at least, it's very much a controlled environment from the point of view yeah. of what the AI brings to the table because we choose we choose their units, right? We, you're basically playing us when you're playing those battles. <laughs> um, so, you know, so we're playing it that way very much. But yeah, so currently we're looking at kind of 20 stack at the moment, but once again, pre-alpha, we may change it at some point, we may not, but that's currently where it's at. Um, but yeah, you're gonna get reinforcements in battle as you would expect from kind of any other total war game, right? So if there's an army next to you on the campaign map and you enter a battle, they will be there to support you, as it were, and be involved in the battle with you while you're fighting. Are we going to see stances? I and mean, Attila obviously stances were quite important and offered quite a variety of different effects from fortified stance to raiding and, and obviously um, increased movement range. Are we seeing those in, in Warhammer? Mm, yeah, I mean certainly to a certain extent stances will be involved in the game, but um, that's something we're unfortunately going to do in the campaign reveal, so wow. I don't want to spoil their thunder. <laughs> um, for the AI, how are you um, kind of developing that to, I, I would hope, give the, uh, probably the, at the higher end of the difficulty scale, the, you know, the toughest experience we can kind of expect with Total War. With each game, you know, always hope that we see improvements to AI to, to give the player, you know, as tough a, a battle as possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. We have quite a lot of chats about kind of what the AI is, what AI represents, yeah. right? You kind of move forward and stuff, because we're constantly moving the AI forward, right? So you saw kind of like the AI Room 2 and the improvements we made to that, like the way it was a lot more dynamic. And like unlike kind of older Total War types, it could actually deal with a lot of situations that previously AIs wouldn't. So kind of like if you look back towards kind of Room 1, for example, and yeah. the way the AI played, it's very uh, formulaic. Whereas the AI now, it's a lot more kind of reactive to you as a player and the way that you play. And then, you know, with Attila, we took more steps forward with that, lots of improvements, kind of like the CJI and things like that, and the way the AI kind of picks what it's attacking. And now, with kind of Warhammer, we're taking that AI as our base and we're continuing to improve and take steps forward. I mean, AI is a big, big thing, right? Yeah. It's, it's not a simple concept and I've learned that very much <laughs> over the last few months on this project. But like, we are really making big steps forward. Like, a lot of our concentration has been on dealing with the new systems that we brought in. So, you know, you know how will AI use spells? How does AI choose? Like for a player, it's probably quite simple to pick what you cast on, right? Like you can just sit there and go, oh yeah, I'll do it on that. But for the AI, it's got to sit there and look at your army, look at their army, analyze the situation, work out what to hit, you know, kind of. There's a lot of analysis going on there under the hood for the AI to work out how to cast. So generally, like, you know, for example, with Curse of Dababnum, which was the spell that the green skinned shaman tends to cast, like, he generally aims it at your weakest ranged unit. Yeah. Or your strongest range unit with the lowest armor. My organ guns went down, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, he really aims that. But he'll change his target situation. He'll know kind of what the situation is and what he should really be hitting. What's dealing loads of damage to him and his army up is bad. Yeah. Just take it down. So, you know, like, we've done lots of work on that. We've also done a lot of work on kind of how flying units are kind of dealt with. You won't have seen it too much in that battle because you get the flying units. But, you know, we've had to kind of work out how would the AI use flying units? And you generally start by going, how would I use flying units? Yeah. And then kind of work backwards from that. 
Um, but like, definitely that's where a lot of our focus has gone, but that doesn't mean we haven't been kind of constantly improving the AI and the way that it works, like for example, kind of working out how the AI uses its generals and works, because like, you've had to change very much how generals work. Like, very previously in games, generals had to kind of sit back. It's very much the kind of Napoleonic era style general where yeah. your general sits back. They're not really an aggressive force in a battlefield. They're actually a lot more a supporting force. They're yeah, there to keep them morale high, support the troops. Morale high, yeah, exactly. Kind of use their abilities and things like that. Whereas now we've got generals who really, really want to be hitting stuff in the yeah. front line, and that is exactly where you want them as well. Right? So we're going to have to deal with that. But then you've got generals who aren't front line, like a, a, a shaman. It's mainly it's useless. They're not very good in a fight yeah. at all. But they're sitting back and like we got the winds of magic mechanics, so you've got your kind of magic meter, as it were, which is kind of going up and down. You're using that pool to cast your powerful attack spells or buff spells and stuff like that. Like, you know, the way they work. So kind of we've done a lot of work on that kind of side of things as well, and the way that generals are utilized yep. by the AI in that situation, as well as kind of campaign side, we're always making improvements and moving forward with the AI system. Yeah. Also, well, definitely um, seeing the improvements in in CGI previously with uh, from from Rome to to Attila, there's, there's definitely been improvement there. So I look forward to, to seeing more improvements uh, on AI in in the battlefield. Um, in terms of battle pacing, how does Warhammer fit between sort of existing total wars? Because um, uh, we've seen kind of as as games get patched and developed, often the battles are made slightly slower or slightly mm. faster in post Um Morale is often quite a, a, a point of contention within the community and when they create yeah, mods, yeah. whether they up the morale and make battles last longer or... It's quite a divisive up. thing in general, I find, but yeah, yeah carry on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but, yeah. Yeah, we got some works going on, by the way. By the way, all this has changed. This yeah. is all new. Uh, I didn't know this was called Fishbowl. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. How is the battle pacing in, in Warhammer? What is it shaping up to be? Are they are they quick battles? Are they slightly more longer and prolonged? Are you mm. are you going to have that system in Attila, which um, as as I played it more and more, I, I came to enjoy. Um, which I, I wasn't sure if I liked it when I first started with units breaking, not necessarily quite easily, but with a lot of men. But then they would rally and they would come back. Are we are we seeing that system in Warhammer or uh, slightly tweaked or? or um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it would be very remiss of us not to kind of try and realize something which the tabletop game certainly does, right? Units have break checks and there's a chance that they'll route, but then before they're gone, because since they reach table edge, they're shattered, basically. Yeah, that point. red yeah. line. There's always a chance. Yeah, the red line. <laughs> oh, don't talk to me about the red line. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, as soon as a unit reaches the edge of the tabletop, they're gone from the battlefield. But at any point before that, there's a chance they can rally, right? You know, you roll a die from their routing to see if they'll rally. I think we'll definitely be bringing that with us, like, forward as we go forward. So morale is, I think, sort of in battle, there's Things where units will break, but they will be able to recover. You know, using your general, for example, with their aura is a really good way to make a unit come back into the fight, as it were. So you're going to see a lot of that kind of morale system still in play within the Warhammer tabletop game. But kind of from a pacing perspective, I think kind of like Attila was a lot slower than Rome 2, in my opinion at least. And I think kind of with Warhammer, although we're still balancing it, right, we still haven't quite locked down exactly how long a battle will be. Per se, like we are looking at kind of similar times to Attila, if not a tiny bit longer. But yeah, I say that's going to probably shift either side as we kind of work out what we're comfortable with. Like it's very much, I think, the one thing you, I'm sure we all agree on is that it's kind of there's like a lot more intense experience. There's a lot going on at the yeah. same time. But because there's all these different factors now, it's not so much the previous game where you'd have a kind of two lines hitting and that's kind of the battle. As it were, I think there's a lot more of kind of stages of battle. So things like you know when you cast spells, you know that's the thing that happens. It's kind of separate to the main melee, but it has an effect on the battlefield. And then the kind of um, kind of putting flying units into the combat, throwing them into the mix. Your heroes and lords as well. So I it think certainly feels like there's a lot more to do in battles in. Mm. I, I think that's the thing. There's. We're trying not to go for micro because you know we want people who maybe don't play Total War professionally, <laughs> yeah. as it were, to like um, be able to play it right. Because you know we want as many people to try this out as possible. Because Warhammer is a really cool universe. Like, yeah. I, I wasn't a massive Warhammer player before I started on this, but I think it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. like, I love the lore side certainly, but like you know I think it's getting to kind of those sort of players. But yeah, we're definitely trying to make sure that you've always got something to be trying out while you're in the battle, like something to do, like, you know, should I cast a spell, should I do that, and you know, and as you are mentioning with the UI, like, a lot of that's in front of you, like, if you want to cast a spell, you can see whether you've got the magic to cast a spell, because you've got your winds of magic 
bar in the bottom right hand corner, like things like that, and just sort of pushing all that forwards and yeah, trying to keep that action going as much as worrying about the actual pacing and the length of the battles itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, finally, just something I know um, it was mentioned in the Battle of Black Far Pass sort of, um, gameplay video that, that was shown, mm. but uh, and it was mentioned that you're looking to continually work on and improve. Um, kind of unit collision and kind of charge impacts. How 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 is that coming along? And kind of what's the what's the the, the aim of that? We're getting kind of more sort of almost uh, um, you know uh, for, I know it's the wrong wrong universe, but Lord of the Rings, Ro hit Ro Rohan cavalry charge smashes. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the, the go-to <laughs> charge impact that I have. It's actually quite interesting because um, when I walked into the office this morning, we were actually talking about that exact same thing, and somebody sent around some videos that one of the programmers had chucked together of. Like the work we're doing on kind of, yeah, the units, collision and the way they work, like we've got loads of units passing through each other and just saying, yeah, function. I think it's one of the things that we know is something that we would like to look at personally and like to continue to improve. And we've done lots of little steps to, certainly when units are in combat, to kind of make sure they're not all quite so tightly yeah. packed together with it and like the collision between units moving through each other yeah, and things there like that. The, the blobbing occasionally with, with yeah, previous yeah. titles that sort of, you know, we want to try and get back to sort of just holding a little bit more, um, not necessarily the formation, but the, almost the but, but the collision itself when they when they meet, being able to actually kind of hold off from each other rather than massing in on each other. Mm. So, like you'll see, for example, with the charges as well, like the actual initial. I think they called it a kinetic front line for a while, but it was a bit right. of a buzzword. Um, but like basically, yeah, that initial hit, that bit where they're kind of two units are kind of charging towards each other and the entities actually make contact. Like we've done a lot of work on kind of smoothing that out, right? Like it's not so much that they touch and stop now, like they actually kind of leap in and they do that and there is actually a movement of the actual battle line because of that and the units are kind of pushing a lot more around it as well. And you look at things like because of, you know, giant units and stuff, we've had to work a lot on that. So if you get a giant unit who are pushing it through, uh, possibly one of your own allied units, possibly let's say you're moving an Arachnoc through some kind of green skin, you know, there's a lot more ability for it to actually push them out of the way and get through that line and then the line will form back up again. So you know, we're doing a lot of work on just, yeah, the way that they kind of collide with each other yeah. and move in, but once again it's something we're just always iterating on because it's something that we kind of really care about and want to get right, you know what I mean? Like we don't really want to not do it justice from that perspective. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. That's and, right. Uh, Love it. The local handyman uh, doing his <laughs> there for that bit. But uh, thank you very much for your time. Oh, it's um, been a pleasure. Looking to play uh, Warhammer again at EGX and uh, have some fun there. Mm, hopefully so. Cool. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. One wrong put right. But the great book of grudges remains full.